So sorry for the lack of updates on the 520ST. I did post a few things in the community page and in Twitter, but I haven't done any actual videos in a while. That's because I ran into some issues uh, with this, as well as the fact that, uh, again, even once I have everything ready and put back together, I have no way of running software on here just yet because I don't have a floppy disk drive. But I figured I'd go ahead and try to finish up part two anyway. And initially, it was going to be a part two and it was going to be like a part three someday in the future. We'll see when, but I think it's going to be a little bit sooner than that. And if you uh, watch the video, especially towards the end, you'll find out why. Anyway, though, let's go on and continue with part two. So let's go ahead and I guess we'll do a part two. It's going to be a shorter video. Also, excuse the noise in the background. Central air is on because it's warm out, et cetera, et cetera. As you can see here, I've got the board here separate from the shielding, and I did start cleaning it. Definitely have a, a little ways to go still. Plus, I still have to remove this uh, shielding here. I wanted to go over some of the things that I did off camera. And uh, one of the things I did was just some of the keyboard and give it a cleaning. I don't have video of that, but I do have some photos that I will overlay as I'm talking here. And the outcome of that, well, this is the base pl plate or whatever you want to call it. It's as clean as I think I can get it, although I don't know if you can see or not, but there is a slight curvature to this thing. And I mean, it's not like there's like a metallic plate or anything to give it any extra structure. So I guess it is what it is. I don't know. Uh, this, uh, I did not disassemble this because I kind of felt like it would have been too much of a pain. So I just spent a lot of time scrubbing, wiping, etc. But it came out really good. I'm actually really satisfied with the outcome. Also, I went and gave all the keys a nice bath. The keys are another thing altogether, though. Some of them have definitely yellowed and others have not. And they are very obvious. Of course, I'm not going to find out. Oh, here we go. If we compare these two, hopefully they show up well on camera. But the E is definitely yellowed more than the greater than sign period key. Uh, and I thought about retrobriting them. However, these key caps are, um, I forget the term, double striked, double stamped. Basically, they have two sets of plastic. And the darker plastic is for the lettering. These are not painted on, so these should never wear out. But I don't know if they're the same types of plastic or different. Retrobriting on its own is already a little bit risky with uh, discoloration, things like that. So I did not want to impact the lettering at all. So I'm not going to retrobrite them. Let me also show you the case, though, which I thought was almost definitely going to have to be retrobrited. Turns out it was just really, really super dirty because uh, it really doesn't look yellowed at all. Especially if you look underneath here basically the same shade and if you compare it to like the space key you can see that there is a difference there or even if we go with the control key so versus uh yeah the plus equals key they're basically the same shade so and you know here's the bottom half of the shell you can see they're basically the same so I'm glad I don't have to retrobrite it because even though it'd be a little bit easier to retrobrite this, I was worried about removing the Atari 520ST logo because it is adhesive and it's metallic and these are very likely to become warped and, and all of that. So the other neat thing that I discovered, so I wanted to avoid the mistake I did with when I was uh, giving the Sega Genesis Model 1 shell a clean a few weeks ago where I inadvertently washed away the paper labels because I wrongly assumed they were metallic. So I went ahead and removed the label from the bottom of the shell. A little bit of adhesive left on here, interestingly enough, which, you know, what have you. But uh, it was proving very difficult to remove it. I would take uh, some isopropyl alcohol and there were some corners peeling up. I would try to peel up a little bit, but it started to tear and tear a little bit. So I try to just let it soak, basically, but it wasn't doing anything. And... I was able eventually to get the label off. However, I think the reason why I was having issues with it is because it's actually a double label. There's actually two of them that were kind of stuck together, and I'm not sure why. And this is going to be difficult to tell because it's backwards mirrored. 
But not only does this have a different serial number, but it's got a different manufacturer code. This is June of 85. And this one is July of 85. So I'm not sure if, you know, they actually put the wrong label on and then relabeled it. Because it, even this one here, it's a white label with black lettering as opposed to a gray letter, gray label with a whitish lettering. Maybe uh, it got to the end of production and they saw issue with it. So they said, all right, well, we'll push that to the side. The next one out will have this serial number. And then they fixed the issues with this one and give it a new label. Not sure, but I think that was uh, kind of neat here. So kind of makes me not want to put this back on so that I can kind of preserve the original label. But we'll see what I do with it. I don't know. Maybe this is common. Maybe this is what Atari did a lot. Can't say for sure. But the shell itself came out very well, very clean. Like I said, it didn't need any uh, retro braiding or anything, fortunately. So lucked out there. Uh, I still have to put together the uh, power supply and the box and everything. And I also have to figure out how to get software on here. Uh, there are several options. I can try to find a replacement floppy disk drive. I think PC drives can be modded because they're all based on sugar standards. Um, but I'm probably going to end up going with a GoTech, you know, everyone's go-to. Problem is, is that while well, this uses a 34 pin connector like PCs, like the Amiga and I think other machines too. Atari, again, because they like to do things their way, decided to go with a 14 pin DIN connector. And I'm having a hard time trying to find one of these affordably. I can find similar uh, 14 pin style DIN connectors to the AV out where you have like this grid array, but I can't find any that have the C or U orientation of the pins similar to like these MIDI ports and everything. There are some sellers in Europe that have them, but they're going to cost $50 plus shipping. And I kind of feel like that's way too much for me to spend on something like that. So I'm going to keep looking and see. At the very least, maybe I'll find a cable that I can just lop the end off and tie it together with a standard uh, 34 pin floppy ribbon. But we'll see. There's also options for the hard drive. Uh, Tara uses the ASCI standard, which is kind of like their own interpretation of SCSI. It's mostly compatible, and there are different hard drive uh, emulator options out there for it, so I may look at that. We will see. But I want to finish cleaning everything up, of course, because, like I said, the board isn't completely done yet, and I've got some little things here and there. i got to put the keyboard back together, of course. Uh, I didn't even realize, but uh, I think they're similar shades of gray, not completely but all right well let's get this keyboard reassembled and i guess we'll do it as a montage of sorts was way harder than it should have been but there we are one thing I did make note of though is that while enter space and left shift have stabilizer bars zero and enter over here do not and that is very strange since they're roughly the same size as the left shift key but I guess that's what they went with and now of course you can see uh, the yellowing here and not here and a little bit here so it's unfortunate that I can't really retro bright. I mean, again, I can, but I don't want to, like I said, run the risk of ruining the uh, double pressed uh, keys. So, of course, I have no idea if this even works at all because I have no software to run it on, as uh, I've mentioned before, because I don't have any way to run software. I do want to get a GoTech hooked up, but in order to do that, I need to make a standard 34 pin floppy drive cable to an Atari ST 14 pin DIN cable. And unfortunately those DIN cables are very, very hard to find. 
In fact, the only supply that I've been really been able to locate is in Europe. And after shipping, it's going to be somewhere between $40 and $50. I can buy pre-made cables for just a little bit more than that. But even that's still kind of high in my opinion. But if that's the going rate, that's the going rate. It is what it is. So, all right, well, let's go ahead and put this thing back together. There she is back together. And unfortunately, that's going to basically be it for part two because I, again, don't have any way of running software. And of course, it is working just as it should. I don't have the mouse hooked up currently, although it does work. For whatever reason, it just stopped working. I reflowed the solder on the joystick mouse ports, reseated the chips put some deoxid in just in case because they were a little crunchy. Put it back together, nothing. Took it back apart, put it back together again, you know, after checking everything again. And it just started working. But I don't have it plugged in because the uh, Amiga Atari ST adapter, the PS2 adapter, these little tabs just make it difficult to plug in. I could probably cut these off, but I prefer not to. Uh, but we'll see. I guess I can also do a pigtail adapter. However, I do have mouse keys. So at the very least, alternate and up, down, left, right work. But I have no other way of testing the keyboard, unfortunately, because of the fact that, again, I have no way of running software. At least I didn't. And I was actually going to release this video a couple weeks earlier. And it was going to kind of be in limbo after the fact, because until I could get a way to do a uh, software on to the system, it'd be very difficult to uh, do anything else with it. But I did manage to find a 14 pin DIN connector. If I could focus here. Actually, I'll just take it out of the bag. And yeah, so uh, wasn't too much money, a little bit more than I wanted to spend, but probably the best option right now. And I could just grab a spare floppy disk drive cable and solder into the points there. And then I've already taken it apart so I can prepare it, uh, but then use, use a GoTech with it. And I just need to solder on some header pins so I can hook it up to a USB TTL adapter, connect it to computer, flash to firmware, and as uh, some like to say, Bob's your uncle. So, And also, as I showed off earlier, I still have to reapply the badge, the unique one that was uh, placed over the original. So, But that'll be it for this one. If you guys have any tips or suggestions or anything like that on software I can run, I do want to try to get some diagnostic software so I can properly test this because it looks like it works, but it might not. Sound might not work. I have to find a way to test that, hook it up to some speakers, et cetera, et cetera. So, so again, if you have any suggestions or anything, uh, let me know in the comment section down below. Otherwise, thanks all. I'll catch you later.